Well, what an exciting... Hey, Lisa, how are you doing? Rose, what an exciting time for the last six weeks. Uh, we've been meeting on Thursday nights, and I've been teaching a small group of people. It can't be a large group because everybody has to get up and speak, and if you had more than, you know, six uh, or so, you know, you'd, you'd be there all night. So it has to be a small bunch, but I've been teaching them everything I know about exegesis, hermeneutics, systematic theology, homiletics is the study of how to preach. And so this morning is their final exam. And uh, this, this message that they're going to bring to you, I'm excited to hear because I have no idea what they're going to say. This, this is their, their final, so they get to choose uh, what they're going to talk on, whether it's going to be expository or topical or inductive, and all these things, they get to choose on their own how they're going to research it. So everybody, look at your watch now. It's supposed to be five minutes. Okay, everybody speaks for five minutes. Introduction, everything included, and we'll have a little timer right here for them. And when it goes off, they have to sit down. Just kidding. Anyway, praise God. How many of you guys are excited to hear the, the messages? So let's pray. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We ask you to fall upon your children as they speak forth your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Okay, so we're going to go in, in the uh, order of the most venerable uh, to the punkish. -ist. So anyway, everybody put your hands together, please. He serves our church diligently Wednesdays and Sundays doing multimedia. He's a man of very, very high character. I'm proud to call him my friend. Everybody put your hands together for Jose Rodriguez. Let me, testing, testing, one, two. Testing, one, two, better, better, has it better? Okay, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Oh, good morning, everybody. Obviously, my name's Jose, and I'm your video media master in the back. Um, like the pastor said, we were tasked with coming up with our own sermons this past Thursday. So I went home, and I had a blank. So I prayed, you know, Lord, hey, you know, give me a sermon. Teach me something. Show me something. So I started looking through the internet i started looking through the um my bible i went through the name topical bible but every time i went looking through something i was interrupted by something else the first interruption came through hey it was the nba finals it was on tv i had to watch it <laughs> then came you know and then i went back and started doing something else and then came the facebook somebody Instant messages me, so I go answer the instant. Then the one, the one more time was my cell phone went, and I had a text message from one of my coworkers who wanted something to know something about the other day. I was so frustrated by the, the time because I was looking at my clock as oh, it's already twelve o'clock at midnight. I'm like, and I have nothing. I says, you know what, Lord, I don't know. I'm gonna go to sleep. And during the time I was about to go to bed, I you know, do my bedtime prayers. So I'm asking, Lord, I want to thank you for everything that you have done for me. And all of a sudden, I had one of those V8 moments. The word distraction came in my mind. I said, Lord, is this what you want me to teach? Distraction. And I and it's like, uh, yeah. So <laughs> I then started thinking, okay, what do you mean by destruction, God? I mean, what is distraction? Excuse me, destruction? I meant distraction. Sorry. What do you mean by distraction, Lord? So, well, oh, thank you. So, <laughs> sorry. So what do you mean by distraction? So, and how is it a sin, Lord? So I was thinking, got up from bed, went to my computer, started typing. I was like, okay, I got it, I got it. Distraction. A cell phone. The internet. The NFL. Baseball. All these things that we have every day is a distraction to us. So I said, okay, God, I got, I got it. You, you got your iPods, you got this. So how is that a sin? And then he showed me Exodus 20, verse 4, which is, you know, I'm going to quickly summarize, which is our second commandment. You must not make for yourself any idol of any kind or image of anything in the heavens. And then I'm thinking, okay, in that part, 
what hits me? Idol. And if you look in Hebrews, and you look at the word where it came from, it's pasal. Am I saying it right? Okay, just, like, just check in with Sounds like it. Jose. Jose. Okay, so, and what does it mean? Hue, hue into shape. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, Lord, back then they had, what did they have? They had wood, they had iron, they had, you know, basically things that you could do, carve out of anything. But I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, I know we had those back then, but how does that relate to now? And I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. All these items that I just said are made by man, by man's hands. And, well, that's cutting it short. <laughs> made by man's hands. So they are idols. Okay, now we see that they are idols and they were made by hand. And they were made by man. So, and they are a distraction to us any day. We, we, we take it and we put all our emphasis in these things. You know, we'll spend plenty of money. We'll spend our time. We'll spend all our resources to get these brand new toys. These iPods. These uh, notepads. These computers. But how much do we spend on the Lord? How much resources do we use to spend on the Lord at this time? How much do we dedicate ourselves to reading the Bible? How much do we dedicate on having relationship and fellowship with our brother man? We don't, not as much as, as we do with our little toys or with the NFL or with, a, hey, I got to take off Sunday to go watch the football game. I'm sorry. So I'm just going to wrap it up real quick. So in Hebrews 12, God wants us to have a relationship with. So he tells us, and this is, comes out of the uh, New, English, uh, New, English, New English translation. As for us, we had this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then let's rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and the sin which holds onto us tightly and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, to whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought of nothing of disgrace of dying on the cross. And now he is seated at the right hand of God's throne. And with that, I want to leave you with the last final verse. It comes out of 1 Corinthians 7.35, New American Standard. This I say for your own benefit. Not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Thank you. Awesome. What do you think? Good job, right? Some of you, uh, no negative comments this morning, just positive. What do you like about that? Right, great simple message, applies relevant, right? Anybody else? Yeah, I like that, huh? Constantly going back to the word. One more. Uh huh. Good crossover. Excellent. Let's give him another hand. Beautiful lady, astonishingly mature. I'm so glad Richard married her. Yeah, anyway, Lillian Bowles. Well, good morning, everyone. So um, I have a small little confession this morning on Friday. On Friday, something happened that um, caused me to get a little upset. So guess what I'm going to be talking about this morning? This anger. But it also got me wondering, is anger always a sin? Well, let's take a look. In Exodus chapter 22, verses 21 through 24, and this is in the NIV, it says, God says his anger will be aroused by the mistreatment of strangers, widows, and orphans. 
In Mark chapter 3, Jesus encounters a man with a shriveled hand. And he asks the Pharisees there, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill. They remained silent, and then in verse 5, it says Jesus turned to them in anger because he was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. So in the Bible, it says Jesus himself got angry. So it must be okay to get angry, right? Well, anger itself isn't always a sin. There is righteous anger, and then there's sinful anger. For the two scriptures that I mentioned in Exodus and in Mark, Jesus himself was angry, so it's obvious then that that's righteous anger. But what is righteous anger, and how can you tell the difference? Righteous anger is when... um, It's when it's it's more of a controlled or a fixed anger... It's when you get angry over the same things that would anger God. And it, so if, is it possible for other people besides Jesus himself to, get, to, be, to have righteous anger? And the answer is yes, you do. And there's an example in Nehemiah chapter 5, chapter five verse 6, where it says that Nehemiah became very angry when he hears from the poor Jews because they are being charged excessive taxes. And because of that, they're having to resort to borrowing money and even subjecting their daughters and their sons to slavery. For Nehemiah, his anger is justified, not just because he's angry that the poor Jews are being taken advantage of, but also because he actually reacts to it in a godly way. He, uh, he addresses the problem, and then he goes and he talks to the rich Jews who are taking advantage of these poor people. Sinful anger, in contrast, is when it's all about you. It's when you get angry over things that affect you, just you. So it's when your anger is focused more on the person and where you want to get that person back as as opposed to the offense or the sin itself. So for the likelihood is that for most of us, sinful, it's sinful anger whenever we get angry. And we have to be kind of careful about that. The scripture understands, I mean, Jesus understands that, you know, we have a tendency to get angry. So there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that address or warns us of anger. And there's a couple here in Proverbs. There's a lot, actually. But as an example, in Proverbs 29.8, it says, Mockers stir up a city, but wise men turn away anger. In Proverbs 29.11, it says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. So the reality is that we're all going to get angry, right? So what do we do about it? Like I said on Friday, something happened that got me upset. So what did I do? Take a deep breath and pray. Just pray. In Psalms 17.6, it says, I thank you, O God, for you will answer me. Give ear to me and hear my prayer. So that's exactly what I did Friday night, and it worked. And I know for you, it will work also. Thank you. Perfect. (laughs) Flawless. You know what makes me angry? God doesn't get mad at the same things I do. So what do you guys, what do you, what do you guys think? Comments? What's wonderful about it? She didn't mess around with uh, lots of stuff. She doesn't write to the scriptures. She doesn't write the personal with each of us. Believe me, Richard can testify. She does not mince around. <laughs> Anybody else? Personalized. Personalized. 
right. That's always that's always great when 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 somebody talks about what what bugs them and how it affected them. One more. How did Lillian's message help you? Right, good, I like that. See the difference between righteous anger and si sinful anger? Awesome, give her, give, her, give her another hand, please. All right, who's next? Matthew! This is the man responsible for discipling your youth, so... Listen carefully. Matt Casamina, everybody. Ooh, 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 ooh. I am not going to tell a joke. That's not my... Boo! You guys seem so sad about it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for having us today. We appreciate your time. Thank you. We hope not to disappoint you. And I actually... Uh, the first two acts were awesome. I, I don't know how I can follow up to that one. <laughs> um, but anyway... Pastor gives us this, uh, 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 he actually threw this in last minute. So what we're doing now is actually a five-minute spiel of something that we didn't have to, or we didn't think we were going to have to do. Thursday night, we thought we were actually going to have to preach the same message that we did Thursday night. So from the time that we started Thursday night till now, <laughs> this is brand new stuff. So it's amazing to see what's going on with how everyone can just Get, to, get, get into the Word and grab something that, uh, that applies to their life and applies to something that they're dealing with. And so for me, because this is a brand new thing and because it's a brand new five-minute sermon, because I'm such an, uh, I'm so OCD and I like to make everything, you know, perfect, it, it, it was tough for me to make something within two days. So I felt anxious. I felt nervous. I felt really overwhelmed. And then to include on top of that my work and kids and, you know, I mean, you, you got your regular uh, everyday stuff that you got to deal with, too. So I, I didn't know how to really approach this. And, and you know, uh, here I am shaking, you know, here I'm shaking <laughs> up here, too, right now. So I'm like, God, what, what do you want me to preach about? Same thing like uh, Lillian, bad day. Same thing like Jose, distraction. For me, it's nervousness. For me, it's anxiousness. So when I researched that, I, I, I looked up the word anxious in the Greek text. So uh, you look it up, it says, merum nao, which means to worry, to care, to concern. So I said, okay, looked up some different scriptures. And I found Matthew uh, chapter uh, 6. And here Jesus, uh, in the New American Standard Bible, is stating verse 27. Uh, and who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to your life? In verse 34, he sums it up and he says, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, okay, Jesus, I get it. You don't want me to worry. You don't want me to be, you don't want me to be anxious. But I can't just not worry. I'm such a worry wart. You know, everything I want to do is, is all about this. It's all about me. Same thing like you, Lily, right? It's all about me. So I prayed again and God reveals the word time. Like time, I guess maybe you know can be a single hour to no 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 time. How does that apply to anxiousness? So I put it in uh, I put it in you know the word search finder in Google. I put it in the word search finder in Olive Tree Bible searching. But what it came up with, completely out of the blue, was Second Peter. And so as you know, Second Peter is of course a letter, and it's actually a letter to the churches. So I'm like, okay, churches, he's speaking to who? And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. So he's speaking to us. He's speaking to people like us. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 9, this is what he says. 
But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. Thus, that the Lord, that with the Lord, one day, it's like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So here God is showing us that whether it's one day or a thousand years, there's really no difference. The Lord has patience. He's not slow. He's not being slow about anything. He's patient with us because he wants all of us to come to repentance. So I looked up patient in the Greek text, and patient says, macro, uh, macro through male, which is to have patience or patiently waited. So here is our Lord patiently waiting so that all of us can come to repentance. So what was God trying to say to us about life, stressful and overwhelming? Well, let's look to God as our example for patience. Don't worry about tomorrow. tomorrow. Philippians uh, 4, 6, 7, I'm going to paraphrase this. Be anxious for nothing. Pray, for, pray with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. He's not only patiently waiting on you. I missed it. See, it was two paragraphs away. <laughs> he is not only patiently waiting on you, but he's waiting for you to possibly save that one more person. Let's all get out there and just go save that one more person. He's patiently waiting for us on that. He doesn't want to leave anybody behind. So let the peace of God guard you. And anyone you help lead to Christ, in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Oh, man. That was great. How many of you guys thought that was awesome? Say amen. amen. Man, so what did you guys like about that, that presentation? We're all anxious. We're all anxious, sure. It's something that relates to everybody. Yeah, the Bible says do not take joy when your enemy is defeated. So, Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody else? It's amazing to see how the Holy Spirit orchestrates it all, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's powerful. Anyway. Next guy, serving in the military, brilliant man, love him like crazy. Put your hands together for Noah Park. Good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of speaking this morning. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Pastor Wendell for all the lessons he's given me and the opportunity to speak today. I'm sure everyone here, if not some, have heard either Pastor Wendell or any of the elders here speak of revival. What is a revival? What does it mean to us? To revive something means to bring it back to life, to regain its health, or to renew its mind. You can only revive a living thing. We as Christians, we have life. We have spiritual life because we have Jesus, our Savior. 1 John chapter 5 Verse 12 says, He who has the Son of God has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So if we have spiritual life, why am I even up here talking about revival, being brought back to life? We, we as children, we, we view the moral breakdown in society. We see the blatant disregard for God and his laws. The Bible tells us Satan is the God of this world, this carnal earth. He's responsible for the gross perversion, the injustice, the violence, and the rebellion against God. The only hope we have to change things in our lives and the lives around us is a return to God and his word, a return to life, a revival. So where does a revival begin? It begins with us here as believers. We see all the problems in the world. We tend to shift the blame to non-believers. It, it, it's not our fault all these things are happening. Yet whenever God speaks of revival, 
His comments aren't directed to the non-believers. They're directed to us. So what does this mean? This, mean, this means the world doesn't need a revival. They haven't sought the life yet. The church needs the revival. Our passion for the Lord needs to be revived. So how do we turn things around? What am I supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and I'll paraphrase, says, If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. God knew his people, the Israelites, would one day disobey and forsake him. So in that past scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God gives King Solomon a prescription for revival. He tells him, your people need to humble themselves. They need to pray, turn from sin. And what's the result? Blessings upon them and healing on the land. Like the Israelites of old, some of us in the church have turned away from God. We live for ourselves. But in order for a revival to fall upon us, God needs to be first in our lives again. We need to constantly study the Bible so we know his word, so we're ready. Kalai told me this morning, always ready, in and out of season. Yeah, Kalai? Shoot. We need to pray. God needs to hear how we agonize for a revival, how we need a revival. It's time for us to become active in the church. It's time for us to care for the old, care for the sick, care for the poor. It's time for us to share our faith with the non-believers. But above all else, it's time to honor and obey God by rooting out sin from our lives. As you do these things, you will see revival come to your life. And it may even spark revival in the lives around you. Thank you. I'm impressed. Bible. Praise God. Who wants revival now? Man. But man, I'll tell you what, I have, I have never in all my years seen a young preacher teacher with the connection he has. You notice how just one thought goes to the next thought, goes to the next thought, goes to the next thought. It's like a train. And it, 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 there's not only, not only is the connection between the thoughts and the ideas solid, but there's no uh, 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 discrepancy about what comes before the other. I mean, brilliant, brilliant placement of ideas. Uh, somebody else, what, do you, what did you like about what Noah did? Everything. Everything? <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, actually, that's true. Because th that, from a homiletic standpoint, if I was his teacher, I would have to give him a solid A, 4.0. Because I, I couldn't see anything that I could even begin to suggest, well, if you want to improve it a little, you could do this, but I, I can't see anything. So, uh, e excellent job. Jose? He was really, really relaxed. Yes. I can see it in his, in his tone, Okay, do you mind me sharing a little bit? Here's, here's the reason why Jose is, is citing that so notably, is because when Noah first started, six weeks ago, he was rigid. I mean, absolutely rigid. He was like Vulcan, almost. <laughs> this, this evening, we're going to be discussing these matters pertaining to scriptural uh, uh, topics that, I mean, it was like, you know, and it was, it was, well, it was a little bit like listening to Morse code, you know, and now he's like, morning, how are you guys doing? <laughs> Shaking and baking, it's all right, yeah. Revival, yo, you know, so. I mean, what, what, what was it that, that, that I want them to hear? What was it that has made you more relaxed and, and, and easier to connect with everybody? The constant prayer just helped me through the entire six weeks. Prayer. 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 I would not have made it this far if it wasn't for prayer. Do you know that John Wesley, the man from Aldersgate, the founder, actually, of the Methodist Church, uh, he would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and pray for four hours before his day would start. And people would tell him, how on earth can you find the time to pray for four hours every morning? And he said, unless I pray for those four hours every morning, I'd never be able to finish everything that I have to do in a single day. So, well, well said. Anybody else? Noah? Park? What? Enormous potential in all of them, wouldn't you say? 
How many, how many, how, how many of you guys would want to hear from any one of these guys again? Amen. Obviously, Jose would like to have more time. So, <laughs> anyway, all right. Uh, when when I, I first met her, Kaleo Ane was, uh, had just lost her mother and uh, was really hurting. And what I've seen happen in her life over the last five years has been exactly what you were talking about, revival. The spirit and the life of God coming back. And here she stands now, gorgeous, married, Kane Park now, uh, 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 Kaleo Park now, wife and, and soon-to-be mother. Uh, we keep Shandara Satori Akia. <laughs> Anyway, would you put your hands together for Kaleo Park. Okay, Lord, let's do this. Yeah, baby. Okay, so you guys all heard about our amazing task that's for today. Um, I went home and I prayed and I asked the Holy Spirit, what is it that you want me to show CCI? And the first vision came on Thursday night, and I saw as I was praying American flags. I saw popcorn, I saw children smiling, and I saw shaved ice. So I was thinking, okay, Lord, no, you're, you're getting me all excited. You, you're reminding me of things that I need to help the youth with. That's not what it is. Friday night came, I prayed again, and when I fell asleep, I had a vision that Noah went to war and what I felt in my heart. And I was driving through Kailua town and I seen all these tourists living it up. I was like, wow, you know, I feel so hurt that my husband's at war, but all these people are like enjoying everything. So yesterday I prayed again because I'm like, Holy Spirit, I don't know what you want me to say. And I saw CCI washed and covered with blood. And I said, okay, Lord, I know what you want me to talk about. You want me to talk about freedom. Freedom is the power or right to act, speak or think as one wants to, without hindrance or restraint. So when I think about freedom, I always, I always hear the saying, freedom isn't free. And it's true. Why? Because we have people in the military. Our military is an organization of men and women of our armed forces that defend us. They defend our constitutional rights. Now, there's millions of people in the military, and it's sad. You hear about it. They, they get wounded. Some are still missing. We don't even know what happened to them. They die for us in the past, present, and it will still be in the future. So one of the things that Noah went through when he first got in was he had to say the oath of enlistment. And the first third of the oath says, I, so-and-so, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear truth, true faith and allegiance to obey the same. So I looked at the Constitution, I looked at the Bill of Rights, and one of the newest things in the Bill of Rights is called the right to enjoy many other freedoms. So I told myself, what is that? And some of it says to live or travel anywhere in the nation, work anywhere as long as you are qualified, marry or raise a family, receive free education. So it's like, wow, a lot of people in the world don't have this. They don't have what we have. So why am I telling you all of this? Because God signed the contract. His son is our soldier. And for us, this is freedom. The Greek word for freedom, eleftheria. It says, we have the freedom from the, from the dominion of corrupt desires, so that we do by the free impulse of what the soul of God and the will of God requires. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18, it says in the, in the NLT, for the Lord is the spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have ha had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. And I thought, wow, Lord, I talk about freedom that the soldiers fight, 
so that we have freedom. But God gave us the freedom too. Jesus died for you and me to give us freedom, to give us eleftheria. So with God signing the contract, Jesus dying, we have freedom and everlasting life, a luxury of knowing that we're safe and we're going to go to heaven when it's our time safely to God. So what should we do in the meantime? Galatians 5.13, it says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So us as believers, knowing that we're going to have this freedom, we need to serve each other with love. In 1 Samuel 12, 24, it says, But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things that he has done for you. So use your freedom to serve one another in love every day. Thank the Lord for your freedom. And as the fourth rolls around, remember those of our armed services, past, present, and future, who have sacrificed for our freedoms. Appreciate their sacrifice and prepare your hearts to serve all that come with love. Thank you. Amen. Good job. Thanks, Dub. <laughs> Isn't she lovely? Wonderful. Very, very nice. What do you guys think? Good? Awesome. What'd you like about it? Freedom. Yeah, you have freedom to like it. What else? Freedom to preach the gospel. What did you like about her message? Right, right. Speaks, speaks not only to the event coming, but also to our life now. Perspective. Because she sees this whole bit of soldiers going off to war a little bit differently than most of us. Now, see, in the old days, you know, when we still had the draft, every family understood what it was like to have somebody go off to war. Either dad went off to war, or when you were an older man like myself, you had a 20-year-old son, you would be sweating that moment where he got his card, and he had to register, and he had to go. So we're a little bit out of touch with how that can affect families now. But she kind of brought it back to home, and she reminds us, she's a wife, and she's very, very aware that, you know, this nation goes to war. He could be called up. So good, good perspective. For, from a homiletic standpoint, awesome, awesome discipline. Because I saw, unless I'm missing my guess, you saw, you got through your message, you looked at the clock, you saw you had another minute left, and then you expanded. And you were able to let yourself say a little bit more. See, what I teach them is, you take a look at how much time you have to speak. And you plan it for shorter than that. Like in this case, it's a five-minute message. So what I teach them to do is plan for a four-minute message. And you have, uh, you know, you want to jaw with the crowd a little bit. You want to engage people. You want to tell a story. You have the freedom to do that. And then, if you still have time, you can add one or two more ideas. Rather than take something that, all honestly, you look at the notes, it would take you 15 minutes to get this out and then you kind of compress it as you're speaking. That's a more advanced technique and that's harder. So anyway, everybody give her a hand. Good idea, good, good, good presentation. I've known this last guy for 20 years now. And uh, he is by far the best looking, uh, uh, I, I don't know who he looks like, but I gotta tell you. But anyway, uh, my son, proud of him, doing great. Put your hands together for Josh Choi. All right, how exciting. I gotta say, it's an honor to stand before this church that I grew up in. I was raised here. Not only that, but also in front of the two people who made me and raised me. So, no pressure at all. So, uh, what I'm gonna speak about today, uh, when we were praying on Thursday night, I felt like God told me embarrassment. I'm like, oh, embarrassment? Because ah. I knew exactly what I was gonna have to talk about. So, uh, on Tuesday we went out golfing, and on the first hole we teed off, you know, and I went to get my ball, and I saw my dad going on the cart path, so, you know, I'm driving, so I just go straight, and as we get over this tiny cliff, I see what I think is the cart path, I'm like, man, that's really sandy, but, you know, hey, Matt didn't say anything, so I'm like, okay, <laughs> go for it. 
into the sand bunker. <laughs> so pulling up, pulling out, and then right as I get to the top, the cart stops, and we're stuck in the bunker. <laughs> so me and Matt get out, we push the cart out, and then tell me, you know, we're all sons and daughters, tell me if you've been here before, Dad. <laughs> so I've been thinking about that, and I've been wondering, you know, like, I felt like the shame come over me. You know, like, I felt so embarrassed because, you know, I wasn't being the person I was supposed to be. I wasn't thinking about it. I just drove straight into a bunker. So, the shame came out of this embarrassment. But I know someone who received more shame than anyone else I know, and that guy's name is Jesus. Now, it says in Isaiah 56, uh, this is the prophecy about Jesus, it says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. Ow! What a mean thing to do. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Okay, who can I sign up for mocking and spitting? Put your hand down, Matt. <laughs> so, and actually something you should know about mocking or, and spitting is that spitting is something horrible to do is a disgrace. In Numbers 12, 14, they were banned for seven days out of the camp if you got spat on. So, to top it all off, Jesus also got crucified. And in Deuteronomy 21, 13, it talks about how posting someone up like that on a pole was like being cursed by God. That's why being crucified is such a horrible death to the Jews. Because it shows that basically you're completely apart from God. Now, in the NIV, in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scoring its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, Jesus bore all the shame for mankind. He has taken it away, and although our shame is natural whenever we're in bed, or we do something wrong. We know that if we seek God's forgiveness, we can go forth without that. We're free from our shame in Christ's, in Christ's sacrifice. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> it's a little short. Amen. You know, you know, when I first started preaching, I was short. I, I always ended earlier than I was supposed to, so it's, it's kind of in, in the genes. Anyway, give him a hand. I, I have actually, Marilyn, never seen somebody that has Josh's anointing. He, at first when he starts talking, it's kind of like you've stepped into a comedy act in a lounge. You know, I'll tell you, I never got any respect, you know what I mean? You know, but he has that kind of delivery, but he's able to use humor to make his point. And here's the, here's the thing I know about human nature, is when we're laughing, we're open to suggestion. And he's able to use that to really get in there, and his mind wraps itself around a very godly thought that's life-transforming and changing. And I, I've never seen anybody able to use humor like him. Here he is talking about the crucifixion of Christ, and you're still, like, sitting there. Uh, somebody else, what would you like about Josh? Nancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's been one of the most exciting things for me over the last six weeks. Is you know because if you're not uh, uh, trained as an orator, you know the the it's kind of like when people sing but they're not used to being a singer. You don't hear their natural voice. It's not like, oops, I'm guessing I'm going over. That's your time. I know. I know. It's like when people are asked to sing, if they're not used to singing, you know, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, this, you know, their voice changes and you don't get their natural speaking voice. And in like manner, if people aren't used to speaking in front of people, uh, the way they talk, the way they act, the way they sound is all very different from normal and that makes the audience feel uh, tense. And so uh, what God has been able to do, uh, uh, because they've been so willing to work with the Holy Spirit over the last few weeks, is really bring that personality out. And we start seeing a whole lot of giftings. Uh, Jose here has got a brilliant mind, strategic, very, very tactical, almost like a military general in the way that he surveys scripture. 
and starts to place everything. Uh, 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 Lillian has got one of the most unique anointings I've ever seen. She has the anointing of ease, where even though she's completely bunged up and nervous, she doesn't seem so. And she puts the audience at, at ease as well. Um, Noah has that, like I was discuss discussing, the, the, the gift of connection, where he's able to put all his uh, ideas together. Kaleo is an exhorter. She can get you excited about responding to what has been brought out. Oftentimes her messages are very, very clear and very, very simple, but you're excited about doing uh, 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 what, what she's suggesting. Uh, and, and finally, Josh here, he has that anointing of humor. So it, it's just been great. And Matt, Matt, he, he actually... Uh, 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 something, you know, something good to say about Matt. Uh, Well, here's, here's the thing. With, with just about everybody else, it was like being given a stone and, and being told to carve a statue. With Matt, it was almost like he was a finished work already because he was a skilled speaker. He's, he's spoken for church before. He's spoken for the youth. So he had all that. So for him, it was more a matter of refining. It was like uh, a golf student who can already drive the ball 200 yards, but you want to get him to go 300 and can already land the ball you know, within 50 yards of the green, but you want to actually have him land it and roll up to the cup. And so for him, it was a fine-tuning thing. And, and it, I, I've been astonished to see how far he's come. He is by far the most natural preacher of them all. And so uh, it, it, it's, it's been great for me. So everybody give them a hand, please. And if I could have my graduates come and join me over here just for a minute. This is your graduation gift graduates where are you congratulations congratulations you finally get something with a commentary congratulations congratulations Congratulations. Congratulations, buddy. Thank you. All right, Josh, can you close us off in a song, please? One more hand for the graduates. Sure, why not? And let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this morning. Thank you for blessing us with, uh, frankly, more talent than some of us thought the church had, man, Lord, you must have great things in store for this church, giving us the resources that you have. So we give you praise for it. Lord, we ask that you, we would learn from the messages we got. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen.
girls to follow and Connie and Keiki, so somebody say praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs>